There are outlines in the back there for today's message if you didn't get one on your way through. And while you're doing that, I want to make an announcement about we're not going to change the outlines on Thursday nights for those who are there because it's hard to stop, stop something you start. But on Sundays, I'm going to email the outlines. If you And so when you leave, there's a sign-up sheet back there. If you want the outlines for Sunday morning, I can email those to you. And then you can print them at your house and then bring them. Because these outlines... May, may be a little more extensive anyway, more paper, more, and then I, I just don't have that time to and uh, make the outlines myself. Now, if you don't have email and you can't print, then there's another, underneath of it, there's an out, there's a, you put your name where you want a printed copy. So I can do a few of them, but I know everybody has email and most everybody has a printer. But in case you don't, put your name there, you want a printed copy, and I'll get, try to get a couple from my, I don't want to overdo my printer because it's just a cheap printer, but I'll do a few extra ones that are printed for those who don't have that capability. But everybody else, you're going to get an email and use your own printer. But on Thursdays, I'll bring the printed copy still. All right? So they're back there, the outline. So Matthew, if you got your Bible, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. Now, as you're turning there, just recap a little bit. You'll see some of this on your outline. We've been looking about the oil and the lamps. If you look up here to the board, on Thursday nights we're talking about spirit, soul, and body. And what I want you to see, so you can picture what we're talking about here today through the lens of spirit, soul, and body. Your, your soul and your body engages the natural realm. That's the lamp. So you need to see your soul is the inside of the lamp and your body is the outside of the lamp. Now that may sound a little, but this works for me. may not work for you. But I want you to see that the soul is the inside of the lamp and the body is the outside of the lamp. Every lamp has an inside, every lamp has an outside, right? That's what needs to be filled with oil. Okay? Because right here is where this oil goes to here. The oil doesn't go here. This body is the light. This body is what's going to shine. Your, your life is what's going to shine. But what's inside of you, which is your mind, your emotions and will, is what's getting doused with the oil. And your spirit is a full supply. So I'm not saying get something you don't already have. You, this is an unlimited, in your spirit is an unlimited supply of oil. you got all the oil you're ever going to need right now in your spirit man. But your soul is where you're going to run empty and the light is going to get dim in your body. Make sense? So this, again... The grace message in the older days when it started getting some gaining some ground wasn't 100% right because they went to the extreme saying you don't need more of Jesus, you don't need more of this, you don't need more of that, you got everything. They weren't looking at it through this lens. So when they say you don't need more of Jesus, let me ask you a question. How many has a full revelation of Jesus in your mind right now? You don't need any more. You got it all. Paul even knew that because he said you have to renew your mind. Paul said, not that I've obtained it, but I press on, I reach forward. So your mind, emotions, and will is in desperate need of more. Not here. So what they did with the grace message was that they told you that, yeah, you had all this and you don't need nothing else. While your spirit, while your soul was burning out. No oil, no grace. You got all the grace right here you need, but you don't have all the grace here, so therefore faith in this activates the well of oil or grace so that you can get it back here and experience it on this level. Is that okay? So we talked about a lot of this on the body, the spirit, soul, and body, but I want to refer to that here a little bit too in the beginning. 
So let me tell you again, just to recap the journey here where we're on as a church and hopefully as individuals, because I think this is what God's speaking to us. And it all started with this, the ten virgins and the oil. And I just explained that to you right there. Five did not have oil. Five did when Jesus came back. And the five said, give us your oil. We don't have any to the five that had oil. And that speaks of, I can't give you that oil. That oil has, you got to get that oil on your own because it's in you. Okay? So the five that did not have oil didn't have the oil within them. So they go to buy it. And again, you can't take that parable because you can't buy God. You can't buy relationship. You can't buy intimacy. That's just part of the parable of him trying to say there are going to be those who have God in them and those who don't. I want to talk to taking this oil and lamps to you who have oil, but you may be burning out. You have the oil, so we're not trying to get oil. You have it. We're just trying to get it from your spirit into your soul so it can get into your lamp there. Okay. So that started our journey when God laid on my heart to talk about the ten virgins and oils, and this thing began to progress, and I began to see where maybe God was taking us. And then Matthew chapter 7, he talks about, I never knew you to the five who had no oil. The other five that had oil, um, you can find them in Matthew 22, where we're going right now, verse 37. And it says here, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Now that's from Deuteronomy. So you find that is God's desire for you. Now when I say desire, I'm going to change it up a little bit. This is not a suggestion. You shall love the Lord. Now you're going to look at that as a commandment. That's not up for debate. It's always been the commandment of God in Deuteronomy and even today. Here's what you got to understand about the Ten Commandments. He knew you couldn't do them, but that doesn't change that's what he wants. He didn't say, I'm going to make up something you can't do, but on the other end, I'm going to get rid of it because I didn't really need it except to show you that you couldn't do it. That's not the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments was this is who God is and you can't do it. You're going to need Jesus to come and put his life in you called grace so you can do it. So it's a commandment to love. God, not a suggestion, not something if you want to do it, that's okay. We're not even talking about a general love for God. Because if, it, if all God wants is just a general love, then he wouldn't say, with all your heart. Who wants a general marriage? When you go and marry your spouse, your whatever, and, and, the, and they do, well, I'm going to love you ge generally, now, for the most part, the average, general, I'll love. Nobody wants something that's just general. I want specific, on fire, detailed. I want it all. God's like, I don't want a general love. That's, all, that's what the church gives him. Oh, I love God. He says, okay, but I want it. I want deep. I want it all. I want all your heart. And, that, and so I can't give that to him prior to the cross. That's why it was a commandment that we couldn't do. But after the cross, before, can't do it. After, because of grace, I can. So it's something now to be pursued. I can love him with all my heart because I have everything in me to do that. Now let me just back up just a second as a sidebar to share with you that the grace message again, is not 100% correct that you're hearing today. Let me tell you, in the early days, this is what I was hearing. The grace message that I was hearing was what I can't do, but God gives us the grace. But the emphasis was on what I can't do. And that's all I heard, and, it's, and that's not a bad thing. I can't do the Ten Commandments, but God gives us grace to do them, you've rarely heard that. What, you, what we emphasized was 
Don't be so hard on yourself. Don't condemn one another. Don't judge one another because we can't do it. God gives us grace. To do it, but the emphasis was on, I can't. So he gives us grace. It's like the cup. Is it half full or half empty? Right? So the emphasis should not be on, we can't. That's why he gives us grace. It's the emphasis should be on what we can do because of grace. Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I got my weaknesses, I got my problems, but thank God for God's grace. That's true, but that's saying the cup is half empty. Let's turn it around and say the same thing, but in a different way, saying the cup is half full. I can do it because of his grace. And quit coming up with excuses why we can't and hope we can tap into some grace. No, I've got the full supply of grace. I can do this. And if I don't, and I fall, His grace is there. Does that make sense? Yeah. <clears throat> so so that, that's, that's where we got to go. But that doesn't change Matthew 22, 37. He's in control of the end. He's in control of the end. You're right. So Matthew 22, 37 doesn't negate because it's a commandment, but now before the cross it was a commandment, but after the cross it's something I can do and should want. I won't even see it as a command because it'll be a want and a desire to love him because that's what grace does. If there's no grace, you'll only see it as a command you can't do. So a lot of unbelievers that are in church a lot of unsaved people in church will try to, that are religious, try to love God with no oil, no grace. And they're going to burn out. That's why they don't last long. You get somebody seemingly so-called saved. They're in for a while, but they're always going to be challenged with no oil, try to do these things, and triers are liars. So I'm not going to try to love the Lord. I now can love Him. And that's the difference. That difference is night and day in your pursuit of, of loving God. You can do this. The grace yeah, I, is there to do this. And I, can you keep your comments till I get I'm to the sorry, end? I, yes, yeah, yes, I will. When I get this on a roll. Yes, yes you okay. are. So you are Matthew 20, 22, 7. God. Revelation chapter 3. Mm -hmm. Now remember, Reve, uh, in Revelation chapter 2, he says you've left your first love. In Revelation chapter 3, He's going to talk to people. He can't even get in the door. So what I'm seeing here in Matthew 7 is that he's going to say to those people, I never knew you. Those are the five without the oil. Then he's going to say to the five with the oil, some of the five with the oil, not all of them, but some of the five with the oil, those that are saved, you never knew me. That's a big thing. It's one thing saying, I never knew you. You're lost. You were religious. You came in and you tried. See, the people he said, I never knew you, they are the ones who came back, but we prophesied in your name, right? These are not unbelievers that are out there on drugs. and These are people that are in the church who, claim, who had the name, claimed the name, and he's going to say, I never knew you, even though they're going to come back with all their works. He's like, I never knew you. Now, on the other hand, these are ones who all tried and failed. Now, the other five, some of them, he never, they never let him in. They're saved, but they never knew him. He knew them, but they didn't know him. And this whole thing is about, let's not be that group of people who, we're not going to be that group of people that he says, I never knew you. But we can be a group of people that he says, you, you, you never, all this time, you never knew me. Because you didn't let me in so that I can open my heart and open your spirit so we can have that communion that he so desires. So the church that we're going to look at today, go to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And it's the church of Ephesus. Now, I'm going to give you the history of this church. And it's really going to, if you, if you have ears to hear, that's all. I, you, you just sit there and this can right over your head because you're thinking about lunch. And you, you don't have a clue about, you don't want to know this love. And I can't do nothing for you. But if you really hear what I'm about to say, 
This should really rock your world. And that's why I did the outlines. Because I really want you to see this. Revelation chapter 2. And we'll start at verse 1. To the angel of the church at Ephesus, he writes, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. This is, just, this is Jesus walking through the church. Verse 2. And he's watching. He's walking in the church to take notes of what they're doing or not doing. Okay? And to this particular church, here's what he's got to say. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil, and you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. So right away he's saying what they're doing that's good. Now this church in Ephesus, if you look at your outline there, it's... Give or take some years here, nobody, they're all debatable, but we're in the ballpark, I'm sure, to some degree. This church has been in existence for 40 years. When, when, when John is writing this letter, this church has been in existence for about 40 years. And Jesus is walking through this church, and he's going to give a definitive statement, revealing the things that are important, affirm the things that they do, warn in what they're not doing, and he issues this church what the, he is, what he issues to this church he wants them to embrace, and the Holy Spirit will get the church to embrace the things that Jesus highlights. So this church is known as the one who has to return to their first love. But before he does that, he tells them the good that they are doing. Verse two. Now verse three. And you have persevered, and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. So he's saying, you are doing what you're supposed to be doing. Look down to verse 6. And that you also hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. So in verse 2, 3, and 6, he affirms the things that are right about them. Then in verse 4, this is what he says. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Now this isn't love for one another. This is love for God. Because God knows that if you love Him, automatically you'll love one another. Because you can't give what you have, what's not been imparted to you. Now go to D, verse 5. Now watch what he says here. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Now that's a big, that's, that's a huge statement. From where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works or else I'm going to come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. So what he's saying here, remember from where you have fallen. And fallen is an intense word for a church that's doing a lot and it's being faithful in so many areas. He says, repent, go back and do the first things. Respond to me as you did in the beginning. 40 years ago when revival hit that church and it became then you planted that church and everybody was on fire. Go back to that place, what you did in the beginning, where loving God was the primary focus. But if you don't, he says he's going to remove their witness, lampstand, their witness or their existence. Now, I want to note something. Would God give up? Now, here's what a question you have to ask you. Would God give up all the works, the good deeds that this church is doing, and the fact that this church is impacting their community, feeding the poor, evangelizing the lost, do you think God would give up all those good works because he's not being pursued with love? Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Now, when I tell you the history of this church in Ephesus, you're going to look at some of these mega churches, especially in the, we don't have, we don't really have a mega church around here. A thousand people is not a mega church. When you're in the 5, 10, 15, 20,000, that's, that's a mega church. 200 people is not a mega church. A guy gets 500 people and he thinks he has a mega church here. But nevertheless, you're going to find out that Ephesus was a mega church when I give you the history of it. And I want you to, before I get, I want you to understand what God's going after. He says, I don't care how many people you have in your church, and I don't care how much you're affecting your community. I don't care how many iPads you're giving away. I don't care how many people you're feeding. I don't care how many you're evangelizing. I just walked through your midst 
and you've left your first love, and I will shut this thing down unless I get it. Amen. So just because you got a nice church, a big building, and a nice parking lot, and a bunch of people, and you got everything you want, and you keep wanting more, your focus is completely wrong. He'll shut it down, or it's wood, hay, and stubble. Well, Lord, did we not feed the poor in your name? Did we not have lights and fog and music? And, and did we not have all? We, we, did, did I not wear skinny jeans in your name? He's like, really? And how much money did you spend, church, to become like that? And what I'm asking for costs nothing but your life. Oh, I'd rather spend the church's bank account than, than waste my life on spending time. That's, I, I, I'm a CEO, God, of a big business here called church. I ain't got time to sit in your presence. I ain't got time to get oil. Look at my works. My works is, is what I want you to do. No, no, I'm looking at your heart, and I, I don't see any oil. I don't see nothing. I see a, I, I'm going to shut it down. Your ministry means nothing to me if it's not got the oil happening. There's no oil. There's no intimacy. There's no love. F, verse 7. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And those who overcome get to eat from the tree of life, which I'll try to talk a little bit about that um, at the end if I have time. And G, this is a church on fire regarding works, and they're doing the stuff. Now, let's look at the church history here. Number two, Roman numeral two. The church in history. This is the context of the church 2,000 years ago. It was the financial center like New York City is the financial center to us. I want you to see Ephesus as a financial center like New York City. Okay? Wall Street. The capital city of Rome, of Roman province of Asia Minor, which is known today as Turkey. The largest city in Asia Minor combines New York City. It is also the capital, which is like putting New York City and Washington, D.C. in the same place. And that's where this church was. It was in the political, it had the political, and it had the financial. It also was a place of um, idol worship. It was the biggest place in that area of idol worship, so it was the biggest religious center. Check this out. It was, it, this church was in the biggest financial city. It was in the political city, and it was the most religious city. It had it all, and this was a mega church. Now, I'll prove it to you here in a second. It was the center of idol worship, and they came from all over to engage that idol worship, which, which produced immorality, occultism, and so forth and so on. Paul established the church at Ephesus on his third missionary journey. This is a church plant of the Apostle Paul around 53 AD. So when the book of Revelation is written, Jesus looking back over 40-some years. So Paul stayed in Ephesus for three years. Now get this, this was the only period of time, the only place Paul stayed that long. <laughs> Ephesus was his place, man. There was a lot going on because the revival was big. So Paul stayed there the longest. It was a big move of God that took place over that time period. Now this church of Ephesus impacted the church in general. It led multitudes to the Lord in all of Asia. The impact was greater than the Jerusalem church. So Jesus' words are really striking when you see who he's talking to now. Not a small church with little impact. This is the mightiest church of its time period. So you would be shocked as they were to hear those words. Now look at Acts. Go to Acts chapter 19. I want to show you something about Ephesus. Acts 19 and 20 give you some biblical history of that city. But I want you to see Acts chapter 19 what they say here. Acts chapter 19 and look at verse 10 and check this out. And this continued for two years so that all who dwelt in Asia, all who dwelt in Asia, not just Ephesus, Ephesus was in the continent of Asia. He says, all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord. Now talk about evangelism. <laughs> so God's like, hey, this church can say, God, we're, we are the biggest church who's doing the most evangelism right now. 
and it didn't matter to him. That's right. Amen. That work did not matter to him. Now, go to 11. Now, God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. So there were signs and wonders taking place there. God was willing to shut that place down if that would be the case. Look at verse 19. Also, many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all, and they counted up the value of them, and it totaled 50,000 pieces of silver. That and today. So in other words, these people were so impacted by the message at Ephesus. This is the beginning stages of the church being planted. <clears throat> that everybody came with everything that was anti-God. It was occultic, Satanism, spiritualism, all that. They brought all their books and had a bonfire. And that would be $5 million in today's money. So that'd be like, that's a lot of, that's a lot of fire. That's, that's, that's huge. $5 million dollars. And today's understanding of that, that many shuck, shuckles of silver, whatever, five, five million dollars. So we're talking about a huge impact. They, this, this church impacted greatly. And you look at that and go, wow, God wouldn't want to give up a church like that that's on that kind of fire for God, would he? It didn't even matter. He was just like, look, I don't see the love. I'm, I'm willing to shut everything down. Mm. Now, yeah. that's church level. What about your level? You have tried so hard to get the best job you possibly could. You've tried to save money as much as you can. You've tried to raise your kids the best. You've given everything to that and little to the love relationship. So I would say God would feel the same way. I, I'll, I'll take that. If I have to take that job away from you. To wake you up to the reality of what I, what's the primary, the job is not your primary, your spouse is not your primary, and your kids are not your primary. I'm, 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 that's all secondary. Amen. What's primary is you're, you loving me with the love I love you with. Give me back that love that I'm giving to you. That's where it's, that, that's the prime, that's what he's looking for in a church, that's what he's looking for in an individual's life. Now watch this. See, when Paul leaves the when Paul leaves Ephesus after three years, he puts Timothy as the apostolic leader. He puts Timothy as the pastor of that church. About ten years after Timothy, John the apostle takes that church and he becomes the primary apostolic leader, the pastor after Timothy. So you see what Paul plants the church. Puts Timothy in there, in, in that church. And then John comes along years later and takes up. This church had the best pastors. Paul? Who would want to be pastored by Paul? <laughs> Timothy? Well, I don't know. Well, if Paul put Timothy there personally, and Timothy was Paul's spiritual son, he had a lot to give. And then you take Timothy out of the equation. Who comes next? John, who was the closest disciple of Jesus. This church had rich heritage. This church had the best pastors. Look how they ended up. You can never say, oh, we've got T.D. Jakes as a pastor. We've got Creflo Dollar. Oh, God's like, really? I, I, that, it's not going to help you, church, if you've got the best pastor if you're not giving out the oil, if you're not in the presence and get, I don't care who pastors the church. What I care is do you love me with a heartfelt love on a level that only grace can bring? Deep calleth unto deep. So it doesn't matter who's pastoring the church. Amen. It's a, it matters on how much oil is being generated in our midst called intimacy. Make sense? So Paul goes to Timothy, Timothy goes to John, and now 30 years later, John is no longer pastoring the church because the government banished him on the island of Patmos so he wouldn't be an effective witness anymore in the cities. So here's John all by himself on an island. And he says, and I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and when I saw Jesus... I didn't see him in a way like I did in the flesh when he was in the flesh where I could lay my head on his, on his breast and love on him. 
I saw Jesus in the spirit and I fell as a dead man. Because the flesh veiled the power and the anointing and the glory and the holiness and the splendor of who God was. But when that veil is ripped, which is the flesh of Jesus, and now he sees him in the spirit, he says, I can't put my head on. I, I fell as a dead man. And then he says, I've got, a, I've got seven letters I want you to give to those churches in Asia Minor. And the first one, John, is Ephesus. And right away, John's like, oh, that's the church I used to pastor. That's the church I took over from Timothy. That's the church the apostle Paul planted. What's the letter, Lord? And then when he gets to this place, you've left your first love. I could see John going, oh my God. You're going to remove the lampstand. I mean, he took this. This was personal to John. This was just not some stranger church. This was the church that he pastored. And when he saw, heard that letter to the church of Ephesus, and he, he says, that's my church. And he says, you've left your first love, and if you don't get it right, I'm removing your lampstand. That had to crush Paul or, or John because it was personal. That's the heritage that, that, these, that, that, that this Ephesus church had. Now, I want you to see something here. Paul planting that church. Go to Ephesians chapter 3. This was Paul's primary message. How do I know? Because it was his primary prayer for Ephesus when he planted it. And it's in Ephesians chapter 3. And it's not about doing good works. It's not about having the biggest ministry in town. It's not about being on TV or having your own Bible college. Ephesians chapter 3. Look at verse 17. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith... That you being rooted and grounded in what? Love. 18. That you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, length, depth, and height to know the love of Christ which passes your understanding. That was his primary prayer. So that was his primary focus. To have their eyes open, Ephesians 1, to have the, their eyes of their understanding open that they may know the love of God that surpasses knowledge. And what happens to the church, Ephesus? They get so busy in the works. Oh, we need a good parking lot. We need more people. We need to evangelize that park. We need to go over here. We need to do that. We need to do this. We need to do that. We need to do that. And what happens is they start drifting in what was primary. Every church will go through this. There is not a church that is exempt from that. Every church will go through that. We went through that. And God's giving us, okay, we're going back full circle again. Let's, make, let's keep this as the primary thing. We taught this, and Diane was with us. I think Diane was the only one back in 4 and 5 and 6. I don't know if anybody else was here. Four, five, and six. But we started drifting and got into other teachings and other things. And the primary thing wasn't the primary thing anymore. And I, I wasn't privy to that for whatever reason. Because I, I think he dropped that as a seed format in us, the, 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 this message. But, you know, like I said we taught on the Song of Solomon three different times. And yet, it, we just could not make that the primary thing. Because it is so easy not to make it the primary thing. You take, take the regular relationship of a man and woman. Now, after the honeymoon is over, he gets settled down into working for the family, coming home and mowing the grass and fixing the house, taking the kids here, taking the kids there. And what happens, not because he's purposely doing it, but his wife or the husband is no longer the primary thing. It's about the kids. <laughs> this happens to all of us. This is not a condemnation. The house needs work. The house always needs worked on. The kids always have somewhere where we got to take them. And there's always this, that, and the other going on. And you start, and you don't even know you're drifting as a husband and wife. You're doing the works. Keeping the family together. The house is looking great. The bills are being paid. Then why is, why is so many ending in divorce? 
Why are so many not ending in divorce but yet still being miserable? Because they, 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 it's like the frog in the kettle. You don't really know it happens till it's too late. And then the other one says, I want a divorce. What? If you, if you don't think the love relationship is the key to all this, how many have seen a... I remember when I, I was recently divorced and I was walking with a friend of mine here at the uh, Perkins Fort, that, that path. <coughs> and I'd seen this guy coming at us. I had a Coke bottle and he was drinking a Coke. and I didn't know him, but my friend did. So as he's walking up, I think to myself, man, this guy looks like he's ready to commit suicide. I mean, there was, his countenance was depressed beyond depression. I was depressed. He made me look happy. That's how depressed he was because I was recently divorced. Well, after we got done talking, I said, well, who is that guy? He goes, oh, he, his wife just left him. I'm like, there you go. He goes, what? I said, I saw that man. I mean, his spirit, the spirit on him was the spirit of death. Horrible. He goes, yeah, she just up and just left. And he told me this history of it. No big deal. But I'm talking like a month or two later. He said, hey, remember that guy we saw? And I, yeah, he goes, I saw him at Big Lots. And he said he was the happiest. I mean, he said he had a spring in his step. I mean, he was just all over. I, he couldn't contain him. And he's like, what's going on? He goes, I found somebody. Now, you can take a guy who's, the, who's lonely or a girl who's lonely, and they're down. you put a love relationship in their life, it transforms them. You've seen it. Love has, natural love has that kind of ability to pull someone. I can, go to, I can go to work and be completely depressed, but now I've got this girl, and now I come to work, and I want to, I want to lead the way. I want to do your job for you. Where everybody had to do my job because I was so depressed and down. Now I've got this new love in my life. I want to do everybody's job. Huh? That's natural love. What do you think real love, supernatural love, can do for you? Let me tell you what it can do for you. Well, I'm just, I don't feel like I'm a success in life. I never had a really good job. I'm divorced three or four times. I, 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 my car smokes. I got 300,000 miles on it. My kids hate me. The dog bites me. I mean, nobody, I, I, I am just freaking alone here. And nothing is working. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> so I could go around depressed, discouraged, down and out. But what makes me a success is I see how much he loves me and I love him back. And that makes me the success. Why? Because it's the primary thing. It's the first commandment. This commandment, I give you a new, the first commandment and new commandment is this. Love the Lord with God with all your heart. That's the primary. If, that, if I'm doing that, I don't care how much money I make. I don't care what jobs I get or don't get. I don't care who comes my way or who leaves me. I'm telling you the answer is not in materialism and the answer to your life is not another person. Those will be great and fine and they'll find their place. But if you're putting all your eggs in those baskets, I'm telling you, you, those, those, those won't fill the void. Yeah. You weren't, these people were not made to fill your void. That's why people are like, well, I guess there's the grass. You know why the grass is greener on the other side? They think these, these people or these jobs can fill the void. The grass is not greener on the other side. The grass that's green is in God. That's the green grass. So it doesn't matter how much money I lose, how much money I get, who leaves, who comes. Man, I am a success because I'm in love with him, he's in love with me, and nothing else matters just like it does in natural love. Two people want to get married. Well, you don't either one have, we'll live on love. <laughs> neither one of us have to have jobs. We'll live on, because at that point, love is stronger than the ability or the desire to have money. Or we're going to live. It doesn't matter. We're in love. Right or wrong? Right. Can I say one, just one thing, Greg? Go ahead. Because love, love is love to us is, is only the same thing as what could have been <coughs> right. It's, 
uh, having sex really calling it lovings. Mm hmm. Yeah. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. Now, Paul says, My prayer is that you know the height, the width, the depth, all that, right? That's my prayer. Now, I think when he closes the book of Ephesians and gives that last benediction called prayer, some call it a benediction, um, I think prophetically the Spirit had him pray this, and I don't know if he caught it or not, may have. But God knew, the Spirit of God in him knew what this church was going to look like in the next several years. After him teaching them the love of God, look at chapter 6, the very last verse of this letter. This is how he closes the letter. Grace be with all those who, what? Love Jesus Who love God. Who love Jesus. In other words, grace be to you who seek to make love the primary thing in your life. You're going to need that grace because it can't be done any other way. If you don't keep the grace of God and the pursuit of and take that grace to pursue this love of God, look what it's, look how it's going to end. And so we fast forward now 40 years and what is God saying to this church? who did not take the grace that was available to be a lover of God, they left that love. They left that first love. They no longer made it the primary thing. You see that there? All right. So <clears throat> the temptation, the temptation is going to be to quit pressing in to that deeper love. That's going to, because you're going to say, well, I, you're going to, there's always going to be things to pull you away, to keep you busy. Too busy to spend. This is why. And I, how many times have you heard me say, I am not smart enough to put these series of messages together? I'll start. I'll put my toe in the water because I think that's what God is saying. And before you know it, it goes to my ankle. It goes to my knee. I Now this, this series is taking on a whole different thing than what I thought it was going to because I'm not that smart. <clears throat> now I, can, I look at this and think, now I know why. Five weeks ago. You think five weeks ago I knew I was going to speak on this? Come on. I ain't that organized or smart. But five weeks ago, he says, I want you, and then whoever else wants to do it, I want you to make time for me. And that's where you get to the, the, the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the first Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of every month, the first seven days of the year, and Monday, the first Monday of every week, Put some time aside to seek just relationship. Not pray about your job. Not pray about a mate. Not pray about anything. But God, make me a lover for you. Because I know that's the primary. That is a commandment which is His will. Look, you wonder what the, well, wonder what the will of God is for my life. What The primary thing is to be a lover of God. No, we, I want to be an evangelist. I want to be a missionary. I want to be, be self-employed. I want to be rich. I want to... I know you want those things. And there's nothing wrong with wanting the things you want. they got to be secondary. Yeah. So what are you praying? God, make me yeah. this, make me that, give me this. Or are you praying primarily Amen. to be a lover of God? That's the primary. If, you're not, if that's not the thing, you know what a trajectory is? You get this right, it changes your whole trajectory. Okay? It's almost like that ship. Remember, if they turn that, that rudder just a little bit, it changes the whole course of their journey. Right. If you don't get this right, if that church does not get it right, it changes the whole trajectory of that church. So if you get this right, you're, you're, everything you want will be right. Remember what Tozer said? If you get the worship right, the work will be right. You want you, you take Hollywood and what he pursues in life. If he wants that, the, if he, the, the loving God is going to be the trajectory of his career. He doesn't get it right on this end. That's not going to, it's not going to work out the way God wants it to work out. It may work out the way he wants to and the world wants to, but what God wants, the same thing to you. What is it you're pursuing in life? You take her going to be a nurse. Loving God changes the whole trajectory of that career. 
you don't get it right on this end, it will affect what you want on the other end. All things get changed and come into proper alignment when you get the first things first. Amen. Making God the primary thing and putting that time aside is, and again, we're not asking you to fast all those three days unless you want. I'm saying maybe one day of those three, maybe three, one meal. Maybe you're not going to fast food. I'll fast the TV and go spend some time. Whatever the Spirit of God and the grace of God is doing, there you go. And if that's not what he's doing, then hey, I can't make it happen. Don't worry about it. Sidebar it for another season of your life. But I can't imagine God saying, well, it's not your season to love me. Come on! It's the first commandment. It's his will. We're all in this season. Unless you want to be deceived by it. So the temptation is going to quit pressing into the deeper life to encounter God to get that oil supply. I'm going to tell you right now, a lot of the church, and maybe many of us, I don't know, I'm not making that call, only you will know this. You right now have a low supply of oil and you're burning out. You're bored with God, you're bored with church, you're bored with worship, and you're about ready to, you're just going through the motions. You may not want to quit church, and maybe some are thinking about, I don't want to do this anymore. Where, let me ask you, why do people quit church? Did God, did God do something wrong to them? No. They perceive something wrong yeah. on God's. God's yeah. perfect. So they've gotten bored with God because they, the primary thing is no longer loving God. This is why people leave each other in relationships. They get bored. They see somebody more vibrant, more this, more that. And they move it and they, they, they think the grass is greener. So people are spiritually burned out. They're burning their wick right now, and they don't even know it, that their lack of oil. They settle, business as usual, just go through the motions. Oh, they still love God, but they love Him generally, and that, He doesn't want general love. Oh, I love God. That's just so, no. You, you won't have to tell people you love God. They'll see it. That's devilish. They'll hear it in your voice, and they'll see it in your actions. What he's wanting us is to cultivate first love. Not just have God as a general love, but he wants us to cultivate first love. Remember what I told you about bad endings? How I had some close friends that have died and they had horrible endings? This keeps you from having a bad ending. There is no way in God's name you're going to have a bad ending when your lamp is full and you're a bright and shining lamp. These guys got a bad ending, and again... How long ago did I talk to you about bad endings? Well, not through this context, because I didn't know we were going to go in this direction. But now let me take that and bring it into this context. Their bad endings, I see now, I know them personally, it's because they no longer made the primary thing, loving God. You can't, you can't get deceived. You can't get into bad sin. You can't walk away. You can't apostatize. None of that can happen if God is the primary thing of first love. You'll be on fire. But, we've, but these guys, and I'm just as guilty, thank God I didn't die in my, in my bad season, maybe. But, again, we don't know how much time we have, and there's the bridegroom call of the ten virgins. The bridegroom cometh, so trim your lamps. Because we don't know when he's coming or when you're going to die. And I don't want to appear before him with a burning wick. Oh, I'm still saved. I loved him in a general way. I'm still saved, but I, I, my wick was what was burning, not the oil. And then I'll find that out on the other end when he says, you never knew me. And there is absolutely zero rewards, if any, for you to get because everything's wood, hay, and stubble that gets burned up. Amen. Okay? So we have to cultivate first love, and that keeps us from having bad endings or getting involved in something we shouldn't. So many people give up because they're depressed, discouraged, they have a wounded heart, they're bitter, they've been deceived. None of that happens when God's the primary thing. That happens when we, like the frog in the kettle, before you know it, how did I get here? It's called deception. Now I want to read something to you. It's on your outline there. I want to read it together because I think it's worth reading. This is from Mario Murillo. Now what's funny is when God put us on this emphasis, first love, relationship, intimacy, knowing God, he let me see a couple of ministries that I don't watch, I don't pay attention to. 
But for some reason, they were dropped in my lap, and I went, oh. I'm like, oh my God, they're saying the same thing we're saying. So I'm like, okay. Then I come across another one. I don't. I, I can't tell you the last time I read anything about from Mario Morello. Probably the 90s. Not not a fan. Not that there's anything wrong with him. Just never did anything for me really. And then the other guy I haven't watched in a long time. So I, God just had me see them and what they were saying, and it lines up with what we've been saying. You're going to think that I wrote this. When we're done with this, you're going to think I wrote this because you're going to hear me say things he said that I've been saying for years now. I watch. A massive, except for the pro prophecy, I didn't know this. A massive number of Christians are experiencing a strange miracle, and we are discovering that this was predicted in detail. But what's this strange miracle massive number of Christians are experiencing? He says, the Holy Spirit is separating them. He has selected them for special grace and power to accomplish mighty acts at the edge of history. They will be uniquely equipped to face the sophisticated evil of our time. But it all begins by making peace with the Holy Spirit and restoring his rightful place. Take a close look at the book of Acts and you will see the disarming down to earth way that they related to the Holy Spirit. While they revered him deeply, they had a sense of his nearness and his involvement in their day to day operation. They behaved as if he was close by and they could almost see him. Most of all, they anticipated his instructions, Acts 13, 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Fairmont, and from there they sailed to Morgantown. <laughs> <laughs> now, sidebar this. We're under the new covenant. I don't have to fast under the new covenant. Well, who they had and who did they separate? Who? Barnabas and who? Paul. So he had an understanding of the new covenant. Wouldn't you think, oh, guys, you don't need to fast. That's, that's old covenant. So the new covenant man engaged in fasting. And let them engage into it as well. So just put that for those who think fasting is old covenant. Millions are now hearing the same call. Separate to me. Just like separate Paul and Barnabas. Separate to me. The Holy Spirit told David Wilkerson about this coming separation. And how pockets of prophetic people would huddle together across our nation. He said, Wilkerson, God hungry people are saying among themselves, this is not it. And we'll stop there. You have to know that's the case here at this church. What we're doing, this is not it. What we're doing gets us to more. Gets us to what is it. Deeper. This gets us deeper, but don't ever get satisfied with, I'm never going to get satisfied with my preaching. You don't get satisfied with the way you worship. You don't get satisfied in that pew. I don't get satisfied behind this pulpit. They don't get satisfied on this stage because that's not it. There's more, and we've only scratched the surface. So that's why we can never say this is it. He says there's something more. Now, this is a prophetic from David Wilkerson. The bigness, now watch, the bigness and sensationalism of the church Christian television, I'll add those in there, has left us empty and dry. No one watches Christian television except ministers to find out what they can copy. <laughs> or what they should wear. What's in vogue? Skinny jeans? Honey, I need you to go to Penny's and get me some skinny jeans. Because uh, so-and-so, I saw that. That's, and, and to the board, we need lights. And we need to make everything black. I want us to have a church when you walk in. It's like walking into a cocktail um, um, night. nightclub. You can't even see each other. So now we're changing everything. Because that's what he saw on TV. He didn't see it nowhere else. Because nobody around this area has it. All we're doing is copying each other. And it's leaving the church empty and dry. Because they want more. More than entertainment, they're tired of watching kids jump up and down and, and, and do all the gyrations that they do, and they call that worship. They've got great guitars, good drum beats. 
got the best sound system in town, leaving you dry. They've got big, showy buildings because they keep putting more into the buildings because they want the... It's like, God, is this building not enough? Wait, we've got to keep changing and putting money? It's, no, 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 we're done with that. It's more than a shallow celebrity gospel. We want deeper values. We want to see Jesus. We want spotless robes of righteousness. We want to go back to doing things in total dependence on God. Many of these people were chased out of churches that were once fiery, spirit-filled churches but went to a new format to attract outsiders. They feel punished for wanting a move of God. Oh, you're old school. That's what they'd say to me. You're old school. No. You're no school. You're not even in the school of Christ. You're in the school of entertainment and big. They're fed up with the world system. Especially when they see it operating in the church. They can't stomach the glitzy entertainment centers anymore. They believe we have no time to play games. They're frustrated that church is catering to the lukewarm members. I got to cater to the lawyers and doctors who just want a social club called church. They're done with the egocentric preachers. How about the guy down in North Carolina has got that big church, and you know what they call him? Goat. I saw this on, on the news. They call him Goat. You know what Goat stands for? Greatest of all time. Excuse me. Jesus, number one, was the greatest of all time. But if you don't want to get that spiritual, I don't think you hold a candle to Paul, Timothy, or even John. You are not the greatest of all time, and you need to keep your congregation from saying that. That's egocentric preachers. And, the, and, the, and there's, a, there's going to be a core group of those who really want the, 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 the purity of church. They're, going to, they're, they're getting tired of this. The grand dose, the expensive and carnal visions that have nothing to do with soul winning or revival. They accuse them of being distracted, even derailed from their first love. Disciples are abandoning attraction churches. See, we're just a little hole in the wall. There ain't a daggone thing that this church can attract anybody to. In fact, you'll drive by it and not even see it. There's nothing about us that draws attention to us. It is a hole in the wall. Well, that's why nobody's coming. Well, if that's the reason why they're coming, I don't want them. Yeah, but if you get them in there, you can... No, no, no. See, their, their motive was wrong from the beginning. These are the troublemakers you're going to have to ask to leave the church eventually because they came for the wrong reason. I don't want them. I'm never going to be what they want me to be. We're, you know, we're never going to have the glitz and glamour they want. That's why they're in the bigger churches with all of that. Mm -hmm. And those are the kind of disciples I don't want. So the disciples are abandoning attraction churches. Something revolutionary is happening inside them. God is starting a fresh movement. David Wilkerson explained more of what he saw coming. Now this is what, more of Wilkerson. God is revealing to all praying people that a glorious new work of the Spirit is about to break forth. God is going to shake everything that can be shaken. He will tear down the old political backslidden ecclesiastical system. He will disown the format super church structure. He will chase out of his presence all who are engaging in self-promoting ministries. God, I would say that's most of them. Yeah. Self-promoting ministries. The praying people he mentions will force changes. They are a new breed for a new need. They are frustrated, hungry, and their numbers are growing fast. They are, whatever that, what's that word? Coalescing. What is it? Coalescing. Coalescing around certain truths, fasting, repentance, and holy surrender to Christ. Now he goes from David Wilkerson to Smith Wigglesworth. He says, Smith Wigglesworth saw this separation coming way back in 1927. He predicted the same group of people that David Wilkerson described. All the people which are pressing into and getting ready for this glorious attained place where they shall not be found naked, where, where they shall be blameless, where they shall be immovable, where they shall be purified by the power of the word of God, have within them a consciousness of the very presence of God within, changing their very nature and preparing them for a greater thing and causing them to be ready for translation. Both men believed that this gathering under the Holy Spirit would begin after a great falling away. What is this great falling away? People that have gotten discouraged, depressed, and bored, and spiritually burned out. 
That's what's happening. And the church has nothing to give them to keep them. Wigglesworth said, we have to see that these days have to come before the Lord can come. There has to be a falling away. There, there are in the world two classes of believers. There are believers which are disobedient. There ought to say there are children which are saved by the power of God which are disobedient children. <clears throat> and then there are, that, see, that's the, the ones, they have oil, but they're the ones God's going to say, I, you, you, you didn't know me. And then there are those who are saved by the power of God who are all time or longing to be more obedient. They're the ones who will know him. I know that the moment these two men predicted us, predicted is upon us. Every Now this is Mario Morello speaking. Every day I receive another account of frustrated saints suddenly driven to hours of prayer. Many are fasting. A vast number are about to find each other in a true outbreak of holy fire. Millions of believers across America feel the they are being separated of the Holy Spirit for some amazing yet unknown reason. Wilkerson talked about a work within us. Wigglesworth talked about pressing in. The image is clear. The Holy Spirit is stirring souls across the nation. They are done with the overuse of big screens, skinny jeans, and fog machines. Thank God somebody else big, bigger than me, is saying that. They are being pulled away from fleshly things even as a spirit of prayer is overtaking them. They are surrendering to a special work of the Holy Spirit. A fresh work of the Holy Spirit has begun. The impact will soon be widespread. I don't want to be on the outside looking in. So what does he say to the book, to the church at Ephesus? Three things. <clears throat> What's he say? Repent. Remember. And act. Now what? Repent. Change the course that you're on. You know that that you, you listen to your top ten prayers. Is any did that did God did the prayer of God make me a lover of you? Is that even in your top ten? Hmm. So repent. Change your prayers. Change your focus and make love, loving God, the primary thing. Remember, here's the kicker here. Some of you had that unadulterated love at the very beginning of your relationship, but the church screwed it up real quick Amen. because they got you into works. <clears throat> they started condemning you. They started judging you. Let me ask you a question. If a little five-year-old kept getting... Let's use Zach. He's got a little... How old is Joanna now? Three, four? Four years old. Joanna kept getting on Zach's um, lap, and Zach's like, Honey, get down. I'm watching football. She's going to feel rejected. Okay? So she comes about an hour or two later. Honey, I'm, I'm trying to take a nap here. He, 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 he pull, pulls her off again. She loves her dad. She was told somehow why her dad loved her. So she's thinking, wow, well, he loves me. I, love, I ought to be able to sit on his lap. But he's always got an excuse why she can't. Then when he can, she may, may have wetted her pants. Get off of me. I can't believe... Honey, she got me all, and now she feels really rejected because he's mad that she wedded on, or maybe she threw up on him, or maybe she's got bad, bad breath. Go, do, when's the last time you brushed? If all she's going to do is get criticized and rejected, I will tell you by the age seven, she will never go near his lap again. It's ingrained in her. She won't even know that she's not going to his lap. And what, what happens? An absentee father, she'll never know. Right or wrong? Right. The church made you think God is that way. You can only sit in His lap if you're perfect. Because the church keeps pointing out your sins. You've got this, you've got that. God's against you here, God's against you there. And who wants to sit in the lap? You don't go to God because you don't think He loves you like that. And, the, and legalism, religion... Judging us, condemning us, forced us out of that relationship because we never, lost, we never saw God in that aspect of love toward us anymore. As a man thinks, so he is. Be it done according to your faith. If your teaching about God is wrong, your relationship with God will be skewed. So you may have started off, and you were shaking your head, so I'm going to assume that was you. You started off right in your love for God, and the church screwed it up. I got saved in the biggest church in the Tri-City area, and I never got it in the beginning. Never got it. Didn't even know about God. God's love. 
for God shall love the world. They, but they never proved that to me by the way they taught or the, by, the, by the way they reflected that love to me. Jesus loves me this I know for the Bible tells me so. We heard all of that but never experienced it. I never was taught it. So I didn't even get what you got. Religion didn't even get a chance to take it away because they never gave it to me in the first place. Because I got saved and went right into church that didn't know anything about this. So what's he say? Repent. Remember. Now you'll remember, but I won't. So I've got nothing to remember because I never had it in the beginning. But I know what to do. Now here's the big one. Act. That's why we're doing the, these Mondays, mm -hmm. Tuesdays, Wednesdays. This is our act of faith to get back into yeah. the flow and fountain of God's love and kindness and mercy and His grace. So you have to make an act because faith is an act. Faith is an act based upon belief. If you believe that love is available, you will act in accordance with that love being there. So act is not a work as much as it is an act of faith. <coughs> I spell faith right. All right, does it make sense? Now, let's close. This is the first commandment. It has to be first priority, the focus of our lives. God does not care about the size of your ministry. He doesn't care about the size of your church. He doesn't care about the size of your bank account or how, much, how great your family is or any of that. He, what he cares about is the size of your heart and how responsive it is to his affections towards you. And um, we got to know that. How many have heard of the guy? Um, man, I don't know his name now. Forget it. Doesn't matter who he is. I can't think of his name. It's an Asian guy. He's a popular. <coughs> not Prince. Um, Prince would not forget that. Anyway, not him. So he's challenged with his love message. And. He comes up and says to them, let me, let, let me tell you something. Now, I'm closing with this because this is huge. I wish I could think of his name. But I can't think of it. But anyway, um, he says, if I came up here and told you that I wasn't loving God the way that I should, you'd go, oh, how modest he is, how humble he is. Give us the message. Come on, give us your message. Would you, you know, in the conference, he's a conference speaker. You'd say, you'd, you'd say, oh, how modest and how humble, but give us your message. That's, that, we're all there. He said, but what if I came to you and I said, i got to confess something. I've been cheating on my wife for the last 20 years. I'm hooked on cocaine, and I'm not living the life like I should. He said, you would, not want, to, you, you would want them to exit me from the stage and you wouldn't, you'd be disappointed in me. And you wouldn't, if I was a pastor, you'd kick me out. Let me ask you this. You, if I came here today and said, hey guys, I'm not loving God, loving God like I should. You'd go, he's on the right path. He's, he's humble and modest and, and he's on the, but if I would have came to you and said, you know what? I've been seeing hookers for the last 10 years. And I've got this, I got AIDS. How would you feel? Would you feel different? From both of those statements, you're not going to go, oh, how humble, how modest. He's seeing hookers. And I've been using the church money to get them. Now, go back to Ephesus. What? Well, you guys are going to roll back there. Now, now go, back to Eph go back to Ephesus. He said, I've got this one thing against you, right? And he says, you have what? Fallen. We have never seen... That God categorizes what I just said to you as sin. It's that sin of neglecting the primary thing that's going to take them out of the ministry. Lose their lampstand. Tell me that's not sin. He says, you've fallen... So when you hear the word, oh, so Greg's fallen, you're going to think of, he must have committed a what? Sin. If I, if you, if, if, if I said I have to repent, you're going to think I'm, I've done something that's wrong. So he uses both of those words. Repent and fallen, and the church will not recognize what it's doing is sin. 
Because we're not doing the first thing he said to do, which we are now able to do because Christ lives in us. So there's no excuse. This is sin. I'm not condemning, not judging. I'm just simply saying, let's see it the way God sees it. If we don't see it the way God sees it, we won't take it as serious as he took it serious with them, as he's taking it serious with us. So we've got to get back to... I don't care. Let's See, if we start talking about this with one another, the, the love of God and, and, what, and, and our experiences and encounters we have with him, it will, it will breed, you know, fire each other up and, <clears throat> and so forth and so on. Um, making that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of every month, Monday of every week in the first seven days, that keeps the fire going. And you do it, maybe do it with one another, challenge one another, talk to each other over those days and talk what about the love of God. You know, you that? It, it's individual. It's oh. not something we do corporately. It's an individual thing. Oh, you don't have a start time? Huh? You don't have a start time? For the... Monday, Tuesday, no, Monday. no, that's just what we do individually. Maybe oh. someday we can do it together. We did that for a little bit there, but um, in the early days. But if that's where it takes off, I'm more than willing and ready to do something like that again, too. So, so does this make sense? Yeah. Look at the church. It's, it's not about... See, you, you're even... We're the opposite of Ephesus. We could sit there and look at that thing on the. We could look at that chimney and go, "What? What? How horrible that is! That is just horrible." And we got no parking, the street parking, and then you know these guys let us have that parking, the funeral home, and you know he needs to paint that church again. It's chipping again. The paint man's right here. We've got chip church. I mean, we could just criticize all. So and God's like, that's see that's see that's the opposite. We're not the mega church. But we could be saying, well, we're, we don't got this. But God's like, I don't care whether you have any. God's like, I can live with that the rest of my life. Can you? Because what's important is, do you come in here and touch my heart and, does, and do I touch yours? Is that not what's important? Yes. Are we not lifting up the name of Jesus and, and, and getting a greater rep? And God's like, that's what I'm about, not that. And I may leave that there the rest of the year just for the purpose of proving that. Yeah, right. Good excuse. <laughs> There's my out. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it doesn't matter whether we're rich. It doesn't matter whether we're poor. You're not looking at the lamp. You're looking at the oil. You're looking at the heart. The heart level. How big the heart is. How much the heart's responsive to your affections toward us. You desire us, Lord, that you may run with us. It's all about relationship. It's all about heart, heart to heart. So Lord, you tell us three things. Repent, change the way we think. That's all that means. Change the way we think. Change our priorities. Change the way we're looking at life. Change the way we're looking at you. Change the way we're looking at church and get the right perspective, the right thing, primary thing, the one thing. The one thing that he told Mary, that David said, there's three people, Mary, David, and Paul, all echoed one thing, and that's that primary thing, making God the lover of our life. And then you say, remember where we've fallen. Repent, remember, now act. Because it doesn't matter how much you amen the message, if you're not going to act, you're guilty. You're even more guilty, because now you know. So, Lord, open our eyes, and God, this can only be by the very Christ in us, the very grace of God that you've given us. God, today we can change the trajectory of our life. Today, by getting first things right, getting the primary thing, the primary thing, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Eric, may I say something? Yeah, we're going to do communion, so don't take off. Well, while they're passing that out, so, um, Friday evening, Robert had to work double so he wasn't home in the evening and I turned on the TV to YouTube and I uh, just turned on music, worship music. Uh -huh. And one thing came on. Uh -huh. And uh, I guess that's through IHOP I uh -huh. guess. But anyway, they were playing, I don't even know what they were playing and singing. I didn't know it. But something dropped in my spirit. 
And it said, first love. Return to first love. They were saying that, or that was no, probably your spirit? No, I don't know what they were saying. Okay. All I know that the Lord was dropping this into my spirit. And it, I was so drawn to, I had to find that scripture in Revelation. So I looked it up, and I read, while they were still singing, I read uh, Revelation 2, well, 1, uh -huh. 2, and it was just flowing, you know, as we read, flowing. And the Lord was speaking to me that we have fallen from our first love, but it is not too late for us. It is not too late for us. He really impressed this upon me, that he is drawing us back to the intimacy with him. He is drawing us back back no matter what age no matter uh what nothing 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 will stop us from returning to him as long we are pliable in his hand he will make us pliable in his hands he has created us to be who we are and he's drawing us back to our first love him and i just saw when he I didn't see his nose. No one no, no, back there picked him up. But when he started speaking about revelation and the first love, and that's the only church that the Lord impressed upon me Friday evening. I said, oh, no. What? And then the Lord, uh, I can hardly accept that now because the Lord said, I want you to share that with the people of God. So there you are. Amen. I don't know if you sense the anointing on that. Yeah, I did. There, that, she's just not talking. That's that's a word of the Lord. There's, there's. Let me tell you, I forgot to say this before we take communion, is that um, this is this has impacted me on the same level as her and probably you as well. But so much so, um, it's it's just changed. Though I I, there, I can't listen to what I used to listen to anymore. Things I were get, getting fed from, I'm like they keep. They're, they're, it's nothing wrong with the with the with the food they're feeding me, spiritual food. It's like it's not where God has me anymore. And um, so I said, God, <clears throat> I know you told me to do that radio thing, but I just it's never really gained traction with me like it should. And um, I'm like, I don't know what I don't want to do with that. I'm not going to stop it because I know you told me to do it, but I don't know what to do with it. And about a day later, I'm praying, and it hits me like a ton of bricks. Make it about this. So I, I changed the whole radio format. It's not the same. It's it's going to be about this. So we're going to do the. So I'm going to teach the Song of Solomon again on it. I'm going to teach. I'm going to read from books like A. W. Tozer. So I'm going to just feed you this message because it should be the primary thing. So let's make the radio that about that. So right now this first three. Um, lessons of Song of Solomon are up there. Their introductory, I'm going to keep up there another week because nobody knew about it probably. It's the introductory. You have to watch them to get you geared on how to interpret that book because that book is what this is all about. But you, after we're done with the Song of Solomon, you're going to be like, I never knew that was what that was about. That's crazy. All that's in there? Yeah. You could get this whole message from that book. You didn't need the book of Revelation. That book would have kept you from... If, if the Ephesus church would have studied the Song of Solomon, they would have never left their first love. No way. So that, that radio for now, and for, until God changes it, it's going to be about first love. It's going to be about intimacy. It's going to be about knowing God. I'm going to be reading some stuff from God. It's going to blow you away. We're going to teach on Song of Solomon. So um, I'm not going to put a lot on there because I know you can't listen to all of it all one week. So I'm going to put it up there couple hours, two or three hours of, of listening. you got seven days to listen to it if you want to go further with this. Um, so keep that in mind. Now, communion. You know what they used to call this in, in the Bible days? Well, I know we call it Eucharist. We call it communion. We call it the Lord's Supper. Supper. But you know what they called it? The love feast. They emphasize love. We've lost the love of communion because we're taking it to what he can do for us and that's good you do that's what's but it's like this is all motivated by love if you under that's why Paul, John said perfect love casts out all fear you won't fear sickness once you understand his love for you you won't fear death 
once you understand, perfect love casts out all fear. You fear because you don't know his love. You know his love, it fixes everything. And so we're going to receive these emblems motivated by the pure love of God for us. So let's take this bread that signifies him break. Because he loved us, he took the 39 lashes on his back so that by his stripes, you, through his love, can be healed. Not, you got to have faith to be healed. No, you have to understand his love to be healed. See, it doesn't take faith to be healed because God says mustard seed does that. We all have that. It's the lack of understanding his love for us of why he did what he did to heal us. Perfect love cast out all fear. Perfect love, greater revelation of his love will also help you receive greater, um, not only intimacy, but the benefits of what he did on that cross. One being healing. Let's partake. You know what this, you know what this cup does? It makes me want to get on the Father's lap. He doesn't smell my breath. I can pee all, I can wet all over him and it's okay. He loves me. That's right. You're right. You understand that? Don't ever think God's not wanting you. We pursue him with, with our sins. We pursue him in our weakness. And we can do that because of this blood. Let's partake. You guys can hang around. They'll worship a little bit. But you're dismissed. See you next week.